We're live? All right. Good evening, everyone. It is Monday, April 30th, a little bit after 6. Uh, welcome to the Oviedo City Council work session meeting. Our first update uh, is the 2018 State Legislative Session update from Mr. Chris Carmody. So, Chris, I'm just going to turn it right over to you and uh, dive right in. Perfect. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Council, thank you for having us here. With me today is Katie Fleury. Uh, you, you have all met her, but just for the record and everyone here, she was uh, Jason's, Jason Broder's chief legislative aide for about six years and joined our team about a year and a half ago now. So this is her second session with us and doing a great job. And she loves the Seminole County um, area here and, of course, loves Oviedo. So she was happy to be a part of the team tonight and during session. Um, what we have here uh, in the, the, what this is called a Prezi, is a general overview of session, and then, of course, we'll get into some of the issues we dealt with on, on your behalf in Tallahassee. Obviously, anytime there's a question, don't hesitate, but otherwise, we'll try to move through it fairly quickly, since I'm pretty sure, based on our memos that we send out and others, you guys are familiar with most of these issues, but again, if you want me to stop on something and cover it, just let us know. Um, so... Perfect. Um, so 2018 legislative session, like them all, had uh, uh, it was uh, next slide as well. It had its own personality, and we'll get into that. But I think it's always helpful to look at the stats. Um, began January 19th, went through March 11th. It's normally 60 days, but we went 62 days. There was a little hang up on the budget, and that was hanged up by the Parkland response bill and some of the gambling issues and the tax package, which we'll get into. Uh, but this is interestingly, you see that second bullet, third time in the last four years the legislature needed overtime to get, get everything done, um, namely the budget. 3,250 bills were filed, including those, those appropriation bills, and only 200 passed. Um, all but one of those were actually signed by the governor, so 199 passed in the law. Uh, so this is, uh, we've, with this slide we like to point out is, if you recall last summer, um, the, and the opioids crisis was front page news, not just in Florida and in our community, but across the country. The president was weighing in, the governor was weighing in, the, the, the U.S. Senate, Congress, and, of course, our state legislators. And most of us in the process thought this is going to be the opioids session. We were, we were advising clients in that space to shape their appropriations and policy asks around opioids because we thought that was going to be where it was going to go. And, and there was stuff that dealt with that this session, and we'll, we'll address that. And then, of course, as you recall, uh, at the end of summer, beginning of fall, we had two hurricanes. Uh, one went through Florida, one went through Puerto Rico, um, Irma and Maria. And then as a result of that, everyone said this is going to be the hurricane session. This is going to be where they do, do all the relief, preparedness, what have you. The House set up a special select committee that had members from all across the state. Bob Cortez from Seminole County was the member for our region on that committee. And they did release a report, and they did some stuff on that. Um, but then going forward in December, two high-profile senators <coughs> resigned over some sexual harassment allegations. The, the hashtag MeToo movement, which was national but also Florida-focused, seemed like that was going to be the what the session was about, the, the legislation and how things were moving through there. And of course, unfortunately, we know that, uh, and next slide, uh, on February 14th, everything changed, uh, not just in the legislative process, but in our state and the country's conversation with the Parkland massacre on February 14th. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Katie to discuss, but needless to say, that, that, that completely changed the dynamics of session, both from a budget perspective and from a policy perspective. Thank you for having me, Katie Flight with Gray Robinson. Um, as Chris was saying, Parkland happened, and obviously everything changed up in Tallahassee. The legislature, the Senate had, um, they met over the weekend to roll out their package, which was then taken up by the House and the Governor. Next slide. Um, with tens and thousands of students, activists, um, and parents protesting at the Capitol, something had to happen, and I believe within a week, they were able to roll something out. Next slide. And the governor, next slide. Oh. And on March 9th, the governor signed the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act. And in the next slide, I'll tell you what's in it. All right, so components of the package. They raised the limit to purchase of all firearms from 18 to 21. They also implemented a mandatory three-day waiting period. And then the last one is extremely optional. I believe the governor was not supportive of it, but if... The school district and the sheriff opt into this program. Um, classroom teachers, if they're not solely classroom teachers, may have training to possess a firearm on campus for protection. Next slide. 
and the fiscal, it had $400 million, $200 million, which is recurring funds, and this happened in the last week of session, so as you can imagine, $400, or $400,000, 400 million, <laughs> sorry, dollars going to something had a very big impact in the state. Which 200 is recurring? I think the um, health, the health count, yeah. The health and the school hardening. So there's some permanent funds to school hardening and then the health side of it. And then next slide. And then with the budget, it was $88.7 billion. The governor vetoed $64 million, which is a pretty light veto for him. Next slide. A breakdown of the budget. There was record, spend, record spending for pre-K through 12 in higher education. $100 million went to Florida Forever, which Chris will cover in a little bit. $130 million was an increase to Medicaid funding for nursing homes. $318 million went to safety net hospitals. Next slide. $85 million went to the Florida Job Growth Grant Fund, $76 million to fully fund Visit Florida, and select state employees got a pay raise, and the tax package of $169 million was in there as well. They put $3 billion in reserves. Next slide. Next slide. Gaming, um, as you know. Can we go back to the last slide? Yeah. On the uh, tax cuts, what was that the uh, sales tax for rentals? So that the entire package, and I know we got a slide touch, on that a little I'll touch later. On that okay. a little bit. So I'm wondering what, what's the recurring risk. You got it. Gaming that was in, they extended. They thought they were going to have a special session. I don't know if you, recently if you guys heard, but that did not end up happening because the governor, I believe, last week it was, um, signed an extension of the agreement that they currently have. So there will no longer be a special session, and everything will stay the way it is. And that's for that one. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, the, the guns in the school. So if you're not a teacher, but you're an employee of a school, and you're not exclusively in the classroom, and I guess you get the school board and the principal and everybody that you can conceal carry in a school. Is that how it, how it is? Chris? Yep. That's how it was framed up. But you have to have everyone sign off on that. So you've already had some school districts come out and say they're not going to participate in that. Uh, you've had some that are, are exploring just getting full private security. Uh, as, as Katie showed in the numbers, and, the, and I'll say one, the numbers are important, and we'll talk about that when we talk about some of the things we worked on, because almost a billion, and there's some other stuff in there, of the budget just disappeared in the last week that was otherwise going to go to projects and other things. The... Um, there's a lot of money in there for school hardening. So there's no surprise. There's vendors coming from all across the country and the world saying we've got the right product or right service for you. Uh, some schools are looking at complete private security and what that would cost and, and how they could get that done through the funds uh, allotted. Um, others aren't. What will happen here is, in a big picture, is because some school districts are opting out, the money can be reallocated to some of the other districts, which will some to obviously to their advantage because on 67 school districts when you divide that number by 67 it doesn't go very far but if you're dividing it by 30 it goes a little further um, my but yes to answer your question non teachers that was a big sticking point especially for the governor he pushed he didn't like any of that provision but it to, to get him to where he would sign it was taking it away from teachers with the whole anecdotal but still nonetheless all too real of Sometimes my teacher doesn't like me. I don't want her carrying or him carrying a gun. Board and I guess the administrative staff in the school itself. Then, right? Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. And the sheriff. And the sheriff. Yeah. And the sheriff. But we're not going to do that. We're not doing that. Yeah, you can. It, the SROs are going to be obviously funded at a higher level now um, it, through this for those who decide to opt in on that. So, so on Florida Forever, um, mm -hmm. this is interesting. So we remember Amendment 1. So let me just say $100 million was appropriated to this for the next fiscal year, and that's the state land buying program. This was a major priority of Rob Bradley, um, and you can see part of Senate Bill 370. Um, Chair Rob Bradley there in the bottom right, uh, that's his photo. He was who replaced Jack Latvala after Jack Latvala resigned. He was the previous budget chair. Rob Bradley took over. We expect that he'll be the budget chair for the next two years under incoming President Galvano. What's, what's important about this is this was a big deal to the Senate, and it affected water projects, which, which we were looking at one. And two, this was the first time since Amendment 1 passed in 2014 that the money dedicated to, through Amendment 1 actually went towards the land buying program, which was sort of the, the, the proponents of that would say that was what it was always intended to do. 
Obviously, the way they drafted the amendment was looser than that, hence why it's been in court. And a lot of money's gone to Springs under House Speaker Chris Foley, who that was a priority of him and others. But this is a big deal because he'll be the budget chair for the next two years, and we fully expect the next two years. Water projects will continue to get a focus, but a lot in the Florida Forever funding of, of state land buying. Next slide. So hurricane preparedness, like I said, was going to be a part of that. Um, the House released their... Um, their list, 78 different recommendations, many of which were included in larger policy initiatives. Next slide. Uh, two worth noting, uh, a study of the sea level rise through the creation of the detailed three-dimensional map of the state. Um, for several reasons, this is interesting. As you all know, uh, the, the government, especially the executive side, has been um, careful not to use the word sea level rise or global warming or any of that. But with this hurricane and some of the other factors, I think they're acknowledging, like, let's just do the study and let's figure out what's going on because what you all know, as we've dealt with here in Seminole County and other areas, is the floodplain maps on a lot of the state were outdated. Um, and in some areas, this wasn't considered a 100-year storm, and yet we still had flood issues. Other areas, it was hitting the 100-year floodplains because of the, the amount of rain and wind. But So this will be very interesting, and it will probably change both the insurance in our backyards and how a lot of those works and, and how a lot of other things are, are, are affected based on these new maps. And then, of course, the study of the petroleum distribution centers to optimize fuel, fuel restoration. That, it, I can't remember in my lifetime the last time we had a, a hurricane that it literally impacted the whole state by the time it was said and done. And up until it hit the state, we were in the full cone. And, I, and, and as you probably saw, the Weather Service is going to shrink that cone a little bit next year. But I saw that some report that said even if they shrunk it, we still would have been in the cone the entire time. It was sort of like a bad horror movie villain. You could, no matter where you went, it kept chasing you. Um, so fuel distribution became a major issue. And so you're going to see that in the upcoming year with a lot of the road projects and such, as they're going to try to figure out how to better optimize that. Because that Chris, became, who came up with the, the sea level rise thing? Who's, whose uh, initiative was that? I'm a, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can, it was one of the House recommendations in that 78. I want to say it was a South Florida rep. Um, that, even the Republicans down there that, again, aren't fans of saying the word global warming out loud, um, they acknowledge just every every single one of those sea level rise maps shows Miami completely underwater in about 30, 40 years. So, they're referring to Jacksonville. Yeah, and well, Jack it's good that Jacksonville. Looking, because I can just tell you right now, I see the beach every week, and I can tell you even after two hurricanes and it is May, the beach is hitting the seawall even now, and there's no hurricanes. So right. that's that's a good thing. So okay. they're, Pump they're, that sand out there. They're looking at it. Um, so the next slide, uh, i got to be honest with you. I get more questions about this piece of legislation than anything else. Uh, and you all weren't asking us to work on it. No one was really asking anyone to work on it. There's a couple members that asked this, but I, but I report to you. The Daylight Savings Bill passed, uh, and if you haven't had a chance to read one of those long, extensive articles, what it basically does is um, allows us, if, 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 con if Congress acted, would allow us to go on Daylight Savings year-round. Uh, currently, we can opt out of daylight savings year-round. We can just choose to be on standard time year-round. And this all goes back to World War II and energy saving and all that. Um, but if, but that would, we would lose those hours in the summertime with that extra time of daylight. Uh, Marco Rubio, at first, uh, this U.S. Senator from Florida, said he would file the bill that would allow us to opt out and be daylight savings year-round. And then the other 49 states-ish, Arizona's, uh, they're not even on daylight savings. or They're, they're on standard the full time. Uh, then he got a whole lot of calls from airlines, airports, professional sports teams, you know, anyone that runs on a TV schedule or any kind of schedule where you wouldn't want to be out of sync with the East Coast and the rest of the country, for that matter, for half your year. Um, so then he said, no, I'll file a bill that will allow the whole country to go on daylight savings time, and so we all get extra sunshine. Um, here's the truth. Uh, they can't even pass Mother's Day resolutions in Congress, so my guess is nothing happens with this anytime we'll soon. Um, yeah, and it, but if they do move on it, I think the pressure given the TV schedules and how that drives, or not even TV for sports, but, I mean, we're a tourism-friendly community, and if you tell everyone, I mean, it's confusing when you try to call your friend on the west coast of Florida and the panhandle. Can you imagine people trying to travel here and, and certain parts of the year? It just doesn't line up. So my guess is with our tourism focus, we're not going to go there unless it's the whole country. So we talked about opioids. I'll quickly go over this. HB 21. Um, that was the answer, and it passed in the final day session. Given even as much as there was a focus on fixing this, uh, the, the kind of the sausage making, it's, it's really difficult to do these because when you get into these, you're dealing with the pharmacy special interests, you're dealing with doctors, you're dealing with, you know, manufacturers down the line. So when you look at the bill, 
Um, in the next slide, you'll see the big deal was they put a um, three-day supply restriction on there for the acute pain opioids, and it's a seven-day supply if the prescriber determines it's medic medically necessary. Um, requires the healthcare professional to review the, the drug monitoring program, and that honestly is probably the biggest deal of all this. That when you talk, start talking about people's information. Um, on Republican and Democrat that just gets people uncomfortable that this information could possibly be shared inappropriately. Um, and in that last bullet, shared with the states and federal. Um, it also, um, there you go, uh, just a couple other things requires continuing education. And that last bullet, that's the interesting point. They actually put their money where their mouth is and put $53 million in the funds to help combat it. So they took the, the threat on our state seriously. There's so many deaths, unfortunately, that are coming from the opioid crisis. Uh, my father's in, in the insurance industry, and he tells me people can't even get signed for insurance if they've ever been on opioids now because it's just it, they don't want to, the insurance companies don't want to mess around with it because it's too dangerous. So hopefully this will bring some daylight to that issue. Wait a minute. So if you've ever like needed, uh, you had surgery and you had to have some kind of opiate-based thing, you can't get. A There's other factors, but that puts a flag up, and they have to look further into it. Yeah, I was surprised by that, but it makes sense considering how addictive they are, and, and the the death rate is, is disturbingly high. Um, okay, so the tax package, Councilwoman Sadek, you would ask about that. The, uh, so um, they always pass a tax package. It's an election year. Um, we get that. They're certainly going to pass a tax package. It was $169 million. Um, so I think I actually assigned this one to you, so I'm going to let you take it. Sorry. I didn't mean to take your slide away. <laughs> As Chris gave my introduction, the $169 million. Uh, mostly there is the seven-day hurricane and disaster supply sales tax holiday, which will be in June. So for a week, you'll be able to get that. There's a lot of tax exemptions for storm-related expenses. We can go into more detail if you would like. There's also the three-day back-to-school sales tax holiday. That will be the first weekend in August. And the business rent tax was permanently reduced by another 0.1%, and it's now 5.7%. Next. No uh, property tax rollback? So that's not in the tax package, but in the overall budget. So that, as you know, the House, for a long time, the required local effort, they, they've been trying to hold. So as, as property values rise, they've been trying to hold neutral. So at least you won't, in your school taxes from the state level, see an increase. The compromise, the Senate took the position that's not a tax increase. That's our tax structure, how it works. And if your property value goes up, we all get it. We have to pay a little more. That was the Senate the House said no, that's a tax increase, et cetera. So what their compromise was, and it was ultimately worked in the budget, not the actual tax package, was new properties would be um, taxed as is. Because uh, the House in their original proposal would be like everyone, not just, not just who was already there, but everyone, including new purchases, would be reduced. So if you're already in at this level, you're not going to see an increase from the state side on your RLE. If you're buying new, so if you went and bought a house next month, or I did, or whatever, you would, you would see the effects of those ri ri rising property values on your, your required local effort. So that was sort of the compromise. And my guess with the current leadership of the House uh, for the next couple speakers, you're going to see that same debate. And I think you'll see the Senate go there. So the Senate will keep pushing back. They don't think it's actually a tax increase. But I don't see Speaker Oliva doesn't it, bending on that anytime soon. I don't think Sprouse either. So for at least the next four years in the House, unless the party shift, I think that's you'll see that so approach. Do we know what impact that is going to have on us? That's about a, it should be neutral at the local level because that's the state's, um, um, that, as I understand it, that's the state's kind of required local effort collection. So they won't, okay. they're not going to require a local school board to, their, on their ad valorem, increase it or collect that. So the so state our, will kick our in. Rate right, could say whatever we want. Right. Yeah. Without any uh, homeowner's exemption increase. Yeah. Aside from that, on the ballot, uh, oh, okay. yeah, we can, oh, okay. we can do whatever we want on our ad valorem. So. Right. That, that is hanging out there on the ballot. We'll talk a little bit about the ballot initiatives later. So. And in the tax package, they put in a bill that expanded the use of tourist development tax. Senator Brandis and Representative Fine did. And essentially, historically, you could, a good example, you could always pay for the, the building, the structure with TDT money, this, but not the road. This bill will, under select circumstances, potentially allow you to pay for the road as well. Um, the County Commission has to vote by two thirds and collect at least $10 million annually in TDT, and at least 40% has to be on tourism marketing. If that's the case, then you would be able to opt into this. Important to note the way this is drafted, to collect at least 10 million, Seminole County does not collect 10 million presently in TDT. Um, and the 40% Orange and Osceola that do collect a minimum of 10%, they don't presently either one spend 40% on marketing. So 
unless they were to increase their marketing or unless Seminole had a bumper year or a boom, um, which they eventually will cross the $10 million threshold, but until then they wouldn't be eligible to do this. But down the line they would unless the numbers change. Okay, so higher education, briefly, uh, this was a priority of the Senate, um, and it, it was President Galvano who, and or President Designate Galvano and President Negron's priority to fully fund Bright Futures at the 175% level. They did that with this bill and it was signed by the governor. And, and, and very importantly, if you have kids in school or will soon, is the pain for summer. The dirty little secret on Bright Futures is even if it was fully paid, uh, most universities, I think all of them require summer classes, but Bright Futures up until now didn't cover your summer classes, so that was sort of out of your own pocket. Um, you also see in the next slide, um, Requires university to develop plans for four-year graduation rate. This was, again, another big deal about Negron. If I'm going to fully fund all these scholarships, I want you getting students in and out in four years. Um, modifications to the performance funding metrics. And then increase the funding for the first generation matching grant. Uh, one thing also on there, not in that bill, but in another bill, I'll just tell you before we get to the pre-K-12 stuff, is um, uh, excess credit surcharge. That was a big deal during the recession, is that if you were taking more than your 120 hours at a four-year university, that the state was um, take, essentially taking back the supplement they give to the university and you were getting a surcharge on your credit hours. And so with Bright Futures not even fully funded and a lot of students, whether in nursing or engineering or pre-med, you usually don't get it done in 120 hours and it takes a little longer. Uh, so the new rule was is if you can complete in four years, so you start in fall of, you know, uh, 20, 2018 and you finish by, you know, spring of, uh, what is that, what, 2023, thank you. Um, you would uh, you would be you wouldn't get the surcharge. You'd get if you went over, you'd get charged. But as long as you graduated on time, you'd get a rebate back. And the whole idea is, if you're out in four years, that's the goal. So if it takes you 130 hours because you had to change majors, or maybe you, you, you did poorly in some classes and had to retake, whatever it may be, um, you can get it back, which is a big win for the students and parents who ultimately probably end up getting the brunt of that, uh, which is good for our citizens here. So on pre-K 12 again. The Senate's priority was higher education. The House's priority to give you the dynamics and plan session was pre-K-12, specifically in the charter school realm. I'll tell you, um, House Bill 7055, which was signed by the governor, that bill um, established the HOPE Scholarship Program, and that's for students to, uh, subject to bullying and abuse, could, could receive a scholarship to go to a private school um, where they, in theory, would not be bullied. If you're not surprised by this, I'll tell you this was highly controversial in both chambers. Um, if you're a public education advocate, you view this as a backdoor way of getting, you know, vouchers to private schools, um, even if it is under auspices of bullying. If you're a charter school supporter, you view this as a very strong thing, or a private school supporter as, hey, school choice, which is a big push in the House Republican Caucus. So those dynamics were in play. There was some negotiating between um, both the House Republicans and Democrats, as well as the House and Senate to get to the finish line, but they ultimately got there. As you can see, it creates some reading scholarship accounts and streamlines the charter of school application process, which will now make it easier to get it approved if the state supports you. Because as it was per currently situated, it's hard to get out of your county level, uh, your school board level, a charter school if they're anti-charter school or just generally not, not inclined to go there. And it was hard to get that appeal done at the state level. This, this appeal will be a little easier as long as all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, how, did, how did they define the, the bullying? How did they define what bullying is in that to where you, because to me, like it's you were saying, yeah, well, that's what, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, to me, it sounds like it, it is like a backdoor way to. The lawyer in me would say not well enough, uh, if only, be, but I think that was by design. They wanted it to be broad. There was a lot of questions of what about the bully? Shouldn't you just get the bully out of the school and that solves all the problems? Uh, they, they weren't willing to go down that route. And, and I get it. They didn't want to reward a bully, like, you know, pick a fight and you get a scholarship to go somewhere. Um, it's, it's already being subject to challenge. Um, and, um, but they, they intentionally wanted to make it broad because they didn't want to capture a specific incident. They wanted to capture all incidences. Um, and I believe the sponsor, uh, Byron Donalds out of Southwest Florida, I, I believe his intentions were not just about helping the charter school this. I think he truly believed in it. But... This was a speaker priority as well, and they wanted to focus on um, school choice aspect of, as well. And so obviously the broader definition, the more you have in the school choice realm. So it, I don't think it'll be struck down by the courts. I think, like I said, the lawyer in me moves it was a little more specific, but I don't think it was overly broad either or vague. I, I, so I think it'll be how, fine. How much can you get for that? 
What do you mean? Oh, uh, I don't remember the actual specific terms of scholarship. I can look that up for you, but. Now, can it, can it be transferred to another public school, or does it have to be to a private or a, a charter? Under a law that passed last year, you can now transfer to other schools as long as there's space, which, you know, got, got a lot of coverage because of the sports implications of it. They, the people were fearful that it would lead to recruiting, and it probably will, uh, anyone who understands sports and high school sports. But the um, but that was, again, it goes to school choice. They, if you were in the wrong school or based on your feet or the parents, they wanted you to have the right but it's based on availability. And quite frankly, in more in some of the urban areas, and I would categorize Seminole as an urban area given our school districts, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of uh, space as is to transfer around. Uh, in some of the more rural areas, there's, there is space, but Orange, Osceola, and Seminole are pretty full on their schools, so that's hard to do. So, but yes, presently you can already do that okay. based on space. Okay. But this wouldn't, this wouldn't override the space availability? No, this, this is more scholarships to go to it. And, and, and so that was part of the driving factor as well, is hey, it, you know, you may not have the option to go to another public school or you would only have the option to go to one in another county and it's too expensive or too long of a drive, but there might be a private school or, or some kind of charter with a tuition requirement right down the road that you can take advantage of. Um, so it, it's gonna be challenged under ch church and state, uh, at least on that, because of the idea that it could go to a, a private, uh, you know, um, religious school. But this, the, the, this Supreme Court, even though the Florida Supreme Court's a little more liberal than it has in the past been, uh, they've been, they've been careful to not strike those down because, it, you know, it's not just going to go to private religious schools. It would go to other private non-religious schools as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the other thing I would point out there, an interesting bipartisan moment. So that last bullet, um, it, it requires the phrase, in God we trust, to be placed in all classrooms, which is interesting. Maybe this shows my bias. I would assume that would come from a, a red county royal rep Republican that you know wants to make a point. This was actually a South Florida Democrat that wanted to make sure that this was that she had her own bill for this. And part of the negotiation between the Republicans and, and Democrats in the House, this got in. So, you know, bipartisanship isn't dead. Um, and now we have, and God we trust, in all our classrooms. All right. So super, we'll quickly go through the supermajority vote on uh, taxes. This is not at the local level; it's the state level. But to be clear, uh, this is a two-thirds, not a three-fifths vote. That was the big debating point: Senate wanted three-fifths, House wanted two-thirds. Um, it passed. It'll be on the ballot, and I believe that'll be the fifth amendment on the ballot before the CRC amendments kick in. And uh, if it passes, the state legislature wouldn't be able to pass any new tax or expand a tax base or a fee without the two-thirds vote of both chambers, which would require near unanimous, or not unanimous, but I mean, you would need the other party's support. And if you're getting that, you would, it's almost unanimous at that point. So it'll be interesting to see if you ever would raise a tax from this point forward unless we we're in a real critical juncture on our budget, if this passes. Um, so given that, off to the polls, we'll see quickly. This was the fifth constitutional amendment. We all know about the super homestead exemption. There's the property, property tax exemption for families of fallen soldiers. Those two were put on there by the legislature. Um, also for first fall, fallen first responders. Then um, the referendum vote for expansion of gambling, that's a citizen petition initiative. And then the restoration of um, voting rights for felons, that's also a citizen, position, uh, citizen petition initiative. <clears throat> so those were the four, this was the fifth. And then of course, we'll go quickly to the CRC, Constitution Revision Commission, uh, composed of 37 members. Um, it's an every 20 year thing. 15 appointed by the governor, including the chair, nine appointed by the president nine by the Speaker, three by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and then Attorney General Bondi in her role as Attorney General is the 37th member. Um, and they get to put them directly on the ballot, no Supreme Court review. Now, they can be challenged legally, but the normal process requires a, a Supreme Court review of the ballot summary and, and legalities of what, what, what you're putting on there. Um, requires 60% voter approval once it's on that ballot, which was a, a new threshold. The last time they met 20 years ago, it was just 50%. So. This will be different, and as you all have seen, 20% is a very high threshold. It's um, more likely than not, amendments are not passed now at the state, leg the state level, um, medical marijuana being the, the exception, but most do not. Um, so, as I said, group meets every 22 years. To get those proposals on, 22 votes were necessary. Um, when they got to the close, and we'll get to what those were, there were 18 proposals that were still alive. Uh, the Style and Drafting Committee condensed those um, down uh, to, to even more proposed, or I think it was what, 13 they voted on. Um, and then only eight made it out of there to go onto the ballot. So what are those? 
Um, style and drafting, as you see, had some interesting combinations of topics. Katie and I have a few fun ones we want to point out. But some of them were not as, not as uh, seamless as peanut butter and jelly when combining things. So, Katie, if you want to jump on a couple of those. Um, PCP 6004, <coughs> like peanut butter and jelly, it places an oil drilling ban in the state constitution as well as creates an indoor vaping ban. So, along the same lines. Those two really. clearly go together. Um, <laughs> um, and then, but the, also 6005 will have on even years, the legislature meeting in January. We've been doing that since two, for the last couple years, but this would put in the constitution that the legislature would continue to do that. On the next slide, you'll see, um, now in defense of the CRC, we poke a little fun on the indoor vaping ban and the oil drilling ban. I think that if anything undoes all these, uh, it'll be that. If I wanted to run with something, I'd run ads on saying it's ridiculous and blah, blah, blah. Um, but we'll see. Uh, it made it more difficult for Asian Americans to purchase land? No, it eliminated it, made it better. Oh, okay, it removes yeah. from the yeah. yeah, it removes. Um, All right. the, yeah, we, you know, like any old state out of the 50, we've got some interesting provisions in our Constitution that of yesteryear certainly don't belong there, and they, they try to do some cleanup on some of those. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the uh, 6007, which will have an impact here if any of you decide you want to join me in the lobby world and be both a sitting commission council member and a lobbyist. They, they, the main area of it is they push the lobbying ban for two to six years, but they also put some restrictions on who can lobby. Um, this is former President Don Gates. This was his, this, his baby, so to speak. He tried it at the legislative level, couldn't get it done. And that was one of the criticisms of this process is that things that couldn't get done legislatively where you had more your hands at the table, they were using this 20 year supposed to be a citizen driven process to get these through. Um, but that was the big one, two years to six years. Um, selfishly, I probably don't have a problem with that issue just because I don't want more competition in my space. But the, uh, but I do, it, a First Amendment side of me says, hey, cities, counties, pu public institutions, anyone has the right to redress government and I have I have concerns anytime you take that right away from someone, even if it's a legislator and you want to avoid them being, you know, overstepping their, their, their power. Um, so you'll see one of the other ones past the last one is that's the ban on Greyhound racing. That was the only standalone provision or truly standalone provision um, that made it through, um, which may hurt or help it. Sometimes when you combine them, it helps them, like the one with dealing with school board term limits also has civic education as a requirement, which most people view as a sweetener. The school board term limits, depending on your bent, is good or bad. Um, so it'll be interesting that E-Verify failed, as you see, that got an X. Uh, the write-in loophole disappointingly did not make it through. As we've all seen locally and across the state, people take advantage of the write-in rule to, to close out primaries. Uh, and you got me all these guys' phone numbers. We could have got texting on there. Yes. Maybe the people can get it right, because the legislature got it wrong again. Well, well, they may, and I was going to say, if you want to jump to the city of Oviedo priorities, one, I have a note here, I didn't put it on there, but the texting while driving, um, so good news is we got it done in the House, and that was a big major step, and we thought we had a lot of momentum in the Senate. Uh, the person whose photo you saw earlier, Chairman Rob Bradley, that was, and as you know, we communicate with you, he was the main stopping point on it, and, and dealing with him on a lot of things, um, he, he has a general distrust of government. Ironic as a sitting senator, but it's a true, it's a true, it's a genuine distrust in the sense I've talked to him on public records issues. He let one get through. I say let one, like he ended up supporting it. It was on the depictions of death. That was the old Dale Earnhardt bill. It sunsetted, and the legislature didn't want to renew a couple years ago. We, on behalf of Orange County Sheriff and others, were pushing to, to put that back in place because of what happened with Pulse and others. If Pulse had happened four years later, all of that would have been public and just it, voyeurism and such, we, we think is, is not a healthy thing. And now what happened down in, you know, uh, South Florida with Parkland, everyone's like, okay, we get it. This, none, this really shouldn't be out in the public domain. If you really need to it, you can sue and get it. So that passed. But I tell you that story is just generally speaking, anything that is viewed as giving the government something over a citizen, he's just generally distrustful of. And the, the, the driving point behind this is the idea that if you make it a primary offense, right now it's secondary, an officer, if they wanted to profile someone, black, white, or otherwise, they could do so because just about everyone, even if they're just on the phone, what have you, seemingly has their phone in their hand or nearby. They shouldn't, right? But seemingly everyone does, and they can just pick who they want to pick over, pull over. That is the concern. It was the same concern with Click It or Ticket, as you recall. I've done my research on this, looking at old news articles. I, I happened to point this out to Chair Bradley of, hey, by the way, you know, this 
the same concerns were there, and, and we don't hear a lot of profiling going on with Click It or Ticket, or at least not on a, on a level that gives us too much concern. But that was the same thing, is now that officers are going to be using that to just pull over whoever they want to pull over and, and sniff the car for weed or drugs or anything else they want to go find and, and arrest these people. So it's probably got a couple more years to go. Um, I really? could see, uh, really yeah, so but, but the good news is the House who used to be some of the bigger anti uh, votes on this because of the whole personal freedom and liberty and, and technology is going to catch up and we won't, it won't be an obsolete law. We, we've got it through the House and as I've learned with anything like the business rent tax and everything else, if you get it through one chamber, you know half the battle's done because very rarely the chambers change course the next year. So it's now you've got one. That, you know, you have somebody as powerful as the Speaker who I spoke to and he won, won before the session started, you know, I was talking to Jason, and he knew how much we were all on this in the city, and he said, no, we're going to get it done this time. I mean, as powerful as he is, one senator can stop this whole thing, you know? It wasn't just him, but it, it was definitely his, his push on there. And um, that being said, I, I expect the House next year will probably try to pass it out early and make it a negotiating point. And if they want to negotiate heavy enough on it, they can probably get it done. Uh, he is, after all, only one vote. Um, and if the House is going to hold some of the Senate position, uh, um, positions hostage, and I, I don't mean to use such a curse term, but that's what happens towards the end. They have priorities, Senate has priorities, and they eventually try to trade at the end of what they want to do. Um, they could probably get it done. But clearly it wasn't something that he was willing to trade on just yet. But Oliva, the Speaker-to-be, seems to be of the same mind that this needs to happen, so I think it will pass the House over the next two years, and it will be whether they negotiate. And, and if anything, Chair Bradley has proven to be open-minded, even if he does have this philosophical bent on distrust. He'll listen to information. So if we start to show him, uh, us and others, show him the true value on this and how we can avoid the profiling, I think we could get him there. But it's going to take an very, effort. Even at the, at the very least, you know, I, I hear all those concerns and they're valid and you respect and whatever. But even if, if an officer is just allowed to stop somebody and put your phone down. I mean, sometimes, you know, you're driving, someone's texting, they're in your lane, you give them the horn, the phone goes down. You know, just to say, get off your phone. I mean, sure. it, it, to me, it's such common sense. Even something like that would be better. Than was that you honking at me earlier? That yeah. would, that would um, be so the, thing would be better than nothing, you know? Um, no, you're absolutely right. And it's a process. We're, we're getting, getting closer to the finish line. Just like the backyard, uh, you know, shooting range. It just sometimes it takes a little education there. Yeah. And I always say, like, as much criticism as Marion Hammer at the NRA got this year in Parkland, she proved to be at least reasonable on that that backyard shooting because we were able to show, like, this 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 wasn't working, and it was, it, you know, it, it, these gun ranges shouldn't have been in certain neighborhoods. It just made no sense, and it was a danger to others. But so, um, it just takes time on some of these. On the local control, I'll point out that a lot of home rule bills were filed, very few passed. Um, CRA, tree trimming, uh, vegetable gardens, Mr. Cobb, I know you, you and Patrick called me about that late in session. That died. And although that one got, before it died, it did get significantly tweaked where it, it was better for everyone. Um, but, uh, you know, you saw a lot of efforts there. But to the kudos to the Senate where a lot of these went to die, they, they stood tall for home rule. And I think you'll see that over the next two years. Um, was the uh, anything on the utility, whatever they call it, the utility giveaway, where we'd have to reimburse them for? That bill was last session, and it ended up being not quite market rate on the 5G, but but the rate went up as session went on, and eventually that was sort of the compromise that was achieved. Uh, the, the main proponent of it, AT&T, realized they weren't going to get something done unless they went up on the rate, so they went up. It was not market rate. Um, at least that's some define it, but it was a it was a better rate than where it started. I'm not sure we're talking the same thing. Okay. Where if a city goes in and uh, widens a road and they have to move a power line, sure. they have to get reimbursed for it or you know, something along those lines. I'm not sure if it was this year or last that year. That was two years ago. That bill, it took them two years to get it done, but it ultimately passed. And the, the version that passed was much better where it was... It wasn't right of way. It was. I'm trying to think of. It was right beyond the right of way, and that's where you would end up having to pay a fee, or pay for the. And, and the point of was, right of way. It's clear, but when you go beyond the right of way, now you're now now it gets a little. It's like the AT&T's argument, which is not wasn't a bad argument. Was at what point do we do do we not have to pay? Like, can you just go forever? That was their argument, and it, it compelled a lot of the folks in the legislature. We get that. So that passed a couple of years ago. So far, it seems like it hasn't been a problem. There hasn't been an overreach um, on that. Now, give it time. Um, 
that perhaps there would be issues in it, but if there are, that's when we go to our delegation and say, okay, you know, you told us this wasn't going to be a bad problem and it's becoming a problem. We, we need to reevaluate re this because, you know, AT&T or whoever it is is coming in and refusing to pay for anything. And this is now costing us, you know, you know, four more million on a road project than we expected because they're, they're saying no way. That's, that's a reason to go to our legislature and say, give us some relief on this. Um, or at least have them meet us in the middle. So if that happens, let's definitely discuss it. Um, on rural boundary, uh, as you all know, this issue came up late in session. We were able to successfully push off on that, working in concert with Seminole County. As we understand it, this, co this conversation is continuing at the Seminole County, and we'll see, as I, as I heard someone say, can they count to three one way or the other? Um, it seems to be 2-2 two -two with the swing vote somewhere in the middle, so we'll see where that issue lies on that. Um, but obviously, if it comes back next session or any version of that that you guys direct us to, we'll continue to work on that. And when you see him on this, kudos to specifically Broder and Simmons were good, but Simmons really, because this fight ended up moving into the Senate, kudos to Senator Simmons for, if anything, just making sure that there wasn't a last second reach. It's one thing if it's vetted and everyone has an opportunity, but, and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone on the other side of, of the advocates of this issue. They've got to go and fight for what they want, but um, it was late in session, which means not everyone always gets to put their eyeballs on it and work on it in the legislative process. So kudos to Senator Simmons for at least saying, if you want to do this, come back, do it in the right way, let, every, let it go through committee and let people discuss it and decide if this is good policy or not, and then we can have that conversation. So successfully it went down and didn't have to go through there. But and on the appropriation side, as we pointed out, um, an unfortunate theme in the wake of other things was a lot of projects died, water projects specifically, and part of that was Parkland, part of that was the, the Florida Forever funding, that $100 million. Um, as you all know, we had uh, the Twin Rivers appropriation in the Senate, uh, and as you know, Patrick Kelly, who's on your team, can, can attest, we, we, we had very productive meetings in the House where the, the, the budget chair, the sub-chair for, for that particular appropriation eyeballed us and said, you're going to be on the list, don't worry. Well. In the midst of all that, the Senate got the Senate and the House changed the negotiation strategy, and it became a take it or leave it on the original House list of appropriations versus the Senate's fully funding of Florida Forever. Um, the Senate blinked and said fine, and the House went with their original list. The Senate got that, and there was no other discussions. There was a lot of talk that there would be an addition to the what they call the sprinkle list, where the presiding officers can add money. And part of that is because even President Negron um, had a lot of district projects that died because they were only on the Senate list, not on the original House list. And everyone, us included, based on conversations with his staff and others, assumed that he would have a water project sprinkle list to just say, okay, sorry, Senators, all your projects died when we did this negotiation tactic that maybe worked, maybe didn't, let them decide. And then that didn't happen. So um, not for lack of effort. Sometimes you can't take the politics out of the process. Going into next session, I know we might have some policy issues to look at, but um, and, and we look forward to working on those. But I would point out a couple things that Katie hinted at it, look, talked about in the budget. Uh, the infrastructure fund was renewed at $85 million. Um, and so if we have a case for infrastructure that would enhance our, an economic position of ours, whether to recruit a company or to enhance an economic position, I think roads are the easy projects, but that's not the only funding that's going to. So I think we should work with you all and your team to explore those options. That fund, the governor has about $20 million left in this current year's funding, but the new pot of $85 million goes into effect next year at July 1, or this year, the next fiscal year. My guess is the governor will fully spend that before the November general election for obvious reasons. I don't need to state it on the record. He's, he's looking to make friends. So um, it'll be this governor that makes those decisions, not the next governor. So we have an opportunity, but I think if we think we're going to go after that, I think we should now start exploring what those options are, shop them with DEO, who kind of grades these, these applications and see if we can't get in position for some of those. And some of these are funded up to $8 million, $10 million. Some of these are funded down to $1 million or less. So no project's too big, no project's too small. Well, here's what the governor's looking at, and I can tell you how he's thinking because we've talked a lot with his staff, is he's going to look at a 10-year government bond. And what's the state's ROI? So if he put a $1 million in a 10-year government bond, if it's 2%, 3%, would this project have the, the, the equivalent ROI over a 10-year period of 3% return on investment to the state in jobs or actual tax revenue or whatever? The, it's not just tax revenue. It's jobs created, which we know he cares about. So if we have that project, let's look at it. Um, and as well, uh, so water projects will continue to be a priority next year. 
Um, we found some success in fire and public safety through David Simmons, I would say, and I know some of those fit in our list. Um, but there's some opportunities in the next session. As you saw, as Katie said, with the gambling uh, extension, that's going to put another 100 plus million back into the budget next year, guaranteed. Um, we don't, ex knock on wood, no tragedies will occur next year that will just take up policy issues, but also budget issues. So opportunities are good, but generally speaking, it was a good year for home rule, even though there are a whole lot of arrows slung our way, most of those arrows fell short of the target, which is good. Um, so, and with anything, it's always an honor to represent you all up there, whether it's the last minute, what's, what's going on with rural boundary issues or, or appropriation projects, we enjoy working on all of them on your behalf. And obviously we'll take questions or comments, what have you. Any questions? On the, uh, on the bills for, uh, on home rule, all the reporting requirement bills died, correct? Mm -hmm. And the, um, and the travel, um, I think there was a bill where you had to like go before the, the you know, in a public meeting. That so came close, but yes, that, 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 failed, that as failed as well. That one's coming back. Um, and there's, <coughs> and again, it's the, it's the tyranny of the anecdote. There's, there's of the 400 plus cities in the 67 counties, there's always someone that does it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And the one that does it wrong leads to the legislator coming up here or there, Tallahassee, and saying, we've got to fix it. It's happening everywhere. I'm unaware of anything you all are doing that should should cause their ire. I'm unaware of anything Seminole County is doing this. But that doesn't change the fact that if you're a conservative Republican that's trying to, you know, fall in line, less is more. So anytime you can lessen government, even if it's not something that you're familiar in your backyard being an issue, they're going to say, sure, let's get behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we successfully defeated a lot of those working hand in hand with the League of Cities and the Senate. Some in the House. The House showed reasonableness on some of these issues and said, yeah, maybe this is a bridge too far. But mm -hmm. Senate was where our real allies were on those particular <clears throat> issues. Could you hook us up with the rules for the TDT funds and the $85 million infrastructure? Can I what with those? Hook us up with the rules. Yes. Because there's probably like, a, is it a matching thing for the 85 or? The 85, not a match, but it doesn't hurt that you're putting your, your money so in the game. So it could be like a totally, like mm -hmm. totally funded by the state. Correct. Or something awesome. Yep. Doesn't it, there's no re, it's a very broad use of the funds. Um, as long as it's infrastructure, they have it, part of the funds can go towards job training with the university or a, a Votech or something else. But most of the funds have been going towards infrastructure um, that that is tied to economic development. Most of the folks getting money have their own skin in the game, whether it's through um, the roadway that they've already started or the design already done or they've done the, the heavy lifting on incentives to get a company to say if the road is built we'll, we'll move here or expand here um, but but no there's no specific requirement that there has to be a match so would fiber optic count yeah that sounds uh, I think that actually does count as infrastructure so if you can that would be, that would be very awesome do you guys like the idea of fiber optic in Oviedo like we have fake out fiber optic right now yeah, the only issue with that, though, in talking with Chris, is it's got to be tied to bringing a company here who needs so it. So a specific company. Right. So it's, it's weird how that, it's strapped. It's not just that you're going to run fiber optic in neighborhoods because it's well, cool. Well, not in neighborhoods. It can't in benefit commercial a commercial area. <laughs> we have it already. It can't benefit a company, meaning, like, it can't be a million dollars to go to company X, like an incentive. That was a house rule. But it can benefit a company in the sense that if company X is saying, I would move there tomorrow. I love everything about Oviedo, except we don't have, as you would say, real fiber optic. We need it to really run our network, um, or whatever it is. <laughs> that, that, yes, then you have a nexus, and if they, they're willing to sign the dotted line as, so to speak, a third-party beneficiary of, the, of said uh, grant funding, um, you know, Enterprise Florida would get engaged and say, this is a real opportunity. This company can bring jobs, and they would tell DEO this is real, and DEO would weigh it, the cost, and. That would, that would definitely put us in play. But to, to the mayor's point, yeah, it's not a requirement that it's tied to a business, but in my experience of what's been funded so far, those have been opportunities where they know of real industry opportunities to grow the economy in whatever community it's in. Whether it's a company is saying, we need to expand, but there's no infrastructure force to expand, or a company from out of state saying, we would come there tomorrow if you just had a road that connected the, the site we're looking at to the rest of the city. So that, we can that's what Osceola used, if I yeah. remember. Yep. Right. They got like eight or ten million or something. Yep, like they that. got one of the bigger halls on that fund. So. Right, but they've got some huge job center coming in. Yeah, that sensor center. But yeah, but they needed the road to get there. Yeah. 
parks. We've got Research Park right there, and they're running out of land, and we've got some, but we don't have high-speed internet, so we can... I don't know if that's I would say it's all on the table, and we, we have the right relationships there with this particular governor and his team to shop those. So we, okay, we, can, we can shop it and make sure before you, you, Brian, and Patrick and the team go through the effort of putting together a 40-page you know, grant application that, that at least it would be given a good review where it's viable. And, that, and that's what, I mean, I joke, that's what you pay us for. Like, let's not waste your time. If this is something that they're going to say, mm, Let's not waste your time. But if they go, oh, that's interesting. You haven't seen that before, but that's something we could we could definitely explore. Let's 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 put something forward and see what they say. On the um, sea level rise study, it's probably too early to tell. But do you know how that's going to be performed? What the department's going to do? The sea level rise, I believe that'll be a DEP um, study. But let me find out. If you could just, uh, I'd just like to know who's heading that up so I can contact them. NASA, NASA will be involved somehow. We've already done it. <coughs> Know it's going to rise three feet in <coughs> 10 or 15 years. But to follow on that, to me, that's talking about stormwater and stormwater capacity, which is what we wanted for the golf course. Yep. And maybe it can be expanded to include inland stormwater capacity and, and whether there's uh, hazards for rain events versus uh, you know, ocean events. Sure, and there's an argument to be said if you believe in sea level and you believe it's rising, like you said, out there three feet, but that will only have an impact inland on those particular issues and others. So um, it's sort of a domino effect. So at some point, if they're serious about that conversation, they've got to be serious about those other conversations. I think part of the conversation up in Tallahassee needs to change, and, and I've said this, quite frankly, with the members up there, is they view project, even though we were in play on that, sto that project, they view projects like that fairly or unfairly, I think unfairly as they call them swing sets in your backyard. Uh, that's not a big, you know, what, what Mayor's talking about, the bridge facility down Austin. That's not a big job center. They're right, it's not a big job center, but your job center is quality of life in your community, which makes people want to live here and then hopefully eventually work here and enjoy the restaurants here that you work so hard to bring in. And if you don't have that quality of life provision, which to uh, at this particular instance is a quality stormwater management so that your, your residents aren't on a two-year storm, much less a hundred-year storm, having flooding issues, um, that's important. And, and a, a lot of members get it. I'm not you know, speaking ill of all of them, but there is that conversation going on in Tallahassee. We, with others, any, any city representatives trying to remind them of it may be a swing set in the backyard, however you want to call it, but that may be the most important swing set to this backyard, and it helps drive what's important to our community, which, again, makes Florida Florida. You know, you, every bedroom community has its own unique personality, and every metropolitan area has its unique industries that they, if, why people come and work there. So um, I, we always caution them not to get too oversold on the metropolitan industry focus and not forget that the bedroom communities matter too because if they don't want to live anywhere, they're not going to move here. Like, Bring them the story of uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, yeah. where the river flooded and took whole neighborhoods, hundreds and hundreds of homes, and they replaced them with golf course. And that's their flood flood forevermore. Yeah, Chris, just one, th one thing, when you get into that and you start talking to whoever's looking at that, the study is great, but one thing I'm, I find out, like in Volusia County, they, they have, they don't have any plans to restore the beach, from like let's say from Daytona all the way down to almost the Space Center. And, and Matthew took out took out parts of A1A up there. The beaches have still not come back. So just the pumping of the sand to get it back to where it was, because like I'll tell you, if those beaches have another two or three hurricanes, I mean, dunes yeah. that used to be 200 feet wide or 10 feet wide. And yeah, Volusia and other counties, coastal counties, are having tough decisions. It's already allowed in the TDT statute for beach renourishment, right. but it's it's not cheap, and it's it's a con but I mean to your point, <coughs> and why that bill particularly passed is that folks are saying that it's not always about marketing. You have to have the right infrastructure in place. Right. Um, it's a very complicated process. Right. The equipment's not available for two years. It's a million dollar. Yeah, like you were saying, but, um, you know, beaches and Disney. Without that, we're all messed up. But if uh, we're having a truck in 30,000 trucks of sand to the Space Center for uh, Matthew uh, damage, and there's only a certain number of places you can get it to dig it up out of a hole. Right. You can't pump it in from the beach because the, the equipment's not there. So we got hmm. trucks going out to the beach every day of special sand. 
special NASA sand. It's, it's got to match what's out there for the sea turtles. I want to see what's oh, coming oh, back yeah. on the shuttles. Yep. Um, <laughs> Bad about them. But I'll tell you, uh, South Florida's, you know, Volusia and Brevard and Flagger are nothing compared to what South Florida's going to face. They're, Thank you, sir. they're just a flat. They have no duty. They got yes. condos on the beach, mm. and it's it's coming. So they're they're looking at. Uh, <clears throat> I think Fort Lauderdale was saying they're uh, 800 million to a billion to mitigate their threat to uh, from storm surge. Hmm. That's a lot of a lot of money, a lot of tax money. All right. Anything else for Chris? How many how many counties or cities can actually take advantage of this TDT? The Based on the 10 million and the 40 percent. All coastal counties, I believe, qualify for the 10 million provision. Um, most qualify under the 40 percent. So, in, in we worked a little bit on that number because of you know CFHLA and some of the hoteliers. They're worried about that you know Orange County, Osceola shifting their focus to roads as opposed to marketing. Um, for example, Pinellas County spent 67 spent 67 percent of their TDT on marketing. Um, and so, and that was sort of the driving force. Is Senator Brandis? That's where he's from. Yeah, his argument was, we can't spend any more on marketing. We're at 95 percent occupancy year-round. They wanted a lift station out by their beach to to allow for greater capacity on their sewer system, because that the, 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 what they as he sold it um, was whether it's mom and pop or a big uh, hotel, they can't afford to put another toilet in there. So you've got these mom and pop hotels that. There's no incentive for them to sell, and there's also no incentive for a big flag to come in and buy them if they can't expand it beyond the you know 50 rooms they have because there's no sewer capacity. So the idea is now Pinellas County could spend some of their money um, to expand, create a lift station, expand that capacity, and then now a big Hilton would come or Marriott would come in and, and buy the mom and pop, and you go from 50 to 150 rooms in that particular location. That was the idea. Um, and so that was what was driving it. But to answer your question, they had 67 percent. When we shifted it to 40, there wasn't a whole lot of heartburn over that. Um, so I'm sure there's some coastal counties that haven't looked at that fine print and are going to go, wait, what? Um, and they're going to have to either raise their spend or um, go ask the legislature to tweak it. But I don't think it will get tweaked next year. That was a – Brandis did not enjoy making that fight. It was – TDT is always a tricky subject. So. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Thanks so much, guys. We appreciate it. Mayor, if I could, I have a question for the council. Um, their contract ends in June. And so I was wondering if it would be acceptable for me to bring a renewal to the council to get them on a contract that doesn't have a specified uh, expiration date that we could just continue working and put it on an agreement much like that would say uh, either party could terminate with a certain amount of notice rather than having on a defined spe specific amount of time. So I wanted to try to get that in place. Since Mr. Group told us for lobbying services we don't have to go out and do RFPs and the like, uh, and then I was just curious if uh, it would be amenable for me to go ahead and bring them up and bring them back for renewal before their contract ends. I don't have an issue with it. Good. Not with the rest of you. Good. Good. There you go. All right. Consent. That's together for you. Then. All right. I was about to get real awkward, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do I? I <laughs> chip. Well, thank you all. Obviously, I think you all have our numbers, but um, if you don't, you know how to get it. But it's an honor to represent you all up in Tallahassee. We're excited for next year's opportunities, of course, and working on some interim projects, whether it's the grant fund or other things. But never hesitate to call. Um, we're always happy to come up here or meet wherever and discuss priorities and opportunities or anything else, rural boundaries, what have you. So. Well, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Say hello to Mr. Gray. Absolutely. Didn't, uh, I just found out he was a, a member of the same fraternity I am in, and he's an alumni association. Usually I lean forward. All righty, Mr. Cobb, I will turn the next one over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we received a request from our uh, from our federal lobbyist about the opportunity for 
uh, representatives of the city to head up to uh, D.C. to meet with the uh, congressional delegation to discuss priorities. Uh, they originally gave us some dates, uh, May 16th and 17th. Uh, Mr. Kelly said, well, you know, that doesn't really give us a whole lot of time to go and try to book flights and the other travel arrangements. Could you give us some more dates? And they gave us the 24th and 25th of this month. And uh, we were curious. I uh, think that would be the 23rd and the 24th. Maybe it is. Of, yeah. of May? Yes, of May. Yeah, that would be Wednesday, Thursday, right? Yes. Yeah, Wednesdays and Thursdays are the best days that they Yeah, seen. that's what they've always done with us. And uh, so we were... Wanting to know if this was something that council wanted to take advantage of and if you had a specific uh, folks in mind that you would like to send up there. And uh, that, was, that was something that has been offered to us and we wanted to get your consensus on what you wanted to do. Well, I'll, I'll go if he gets on the plane and goes, nope. <laughs> nope. Are, are they going to cover it as part of their 5000 a month? <laughs> I, have, uh, I have the plan. I already talked to Patrick just before we even got him on. He's the Washington guru. He does his dog and pony show good, so I'm nominating you too. 23rd and 24th, though. If that's what I'm directed to do. <laughs> well, what would you be advocating for? I, I was speaking with uh, Helen Miller this morning about whether it would be productive for us to go up there. Uh, who's, uh, she is uh, the local person for, for Bill Nelson, and she thinks you're pretty great, by the way. Um, so any, anytime I call her, she answers the phone, and, uh, and I'm wondering what it is we would accomplish by transporting anybody up there versus just calling people who are very receptive to helping us. Like they're all the the staff people I've ever spoken with at the federal level, they're always eager to help us. Having so that, been there before, I think they just put a, a face to the name of the city. That that's what it seems to be able to do when we're there. You know, at least when we give the lobbyists something to go in and lobby for, they've attached a face to the name to the project, and that's what we've been able to accomplish over the years. I mean, we've gone, we haven't been up in years. I mean, it's, I don't know how many years it's been, but it seems like it's been at least five years, right? My recollection was about 2011, late, maybe early 2012. Mary Lou was still here. She came. I, I think we went one time after that, didn't we? I don't know. Because we went when um, uh, Catherine was the city manager. That was the last time I think we went, and I don't remember when that was then. When you get up, when you get up there, though, those trips that, that that I have been on, you know, going into into their home field, you, you seem to get more of a, a result. We have met Senator Nelson up there, and we have met him here. We met him in both places, and I can tell you the last time we went up there, remember we were in the room, there's like, he was very busy, but there was, there was like 50 cities in there. I mean, he looked right at us, he goes, tell, you know, he turned to me, he was in the back and said, you know, tell me what's going on in Oviedo, and we did, and he helped us with certain stuff and whatever, but you're, you're more apt to get stuff done, I think, while you're up there, you know. I think we've had some successes in the past, so. But having you up there and having your knowledge, we're going around with Congressman Micah. I mean, it's like this and doors. You could probably open up that, you know, might just be on a, hey, I'm here, let's go knock at this guy's door, whatever. So I think you're, you're a gimme. It, it never hurts no. to meet with your federal representatives face to face in whatever capacity that might be. Um, I will do whatever I can to make it a success. Yeah, we'll just put a list together of what we want to accomplish like we usually do and handouts, you know, the lead binds, you know, all the stuff that we used to do. See what we Focuses can accomplish. FEMA process? Mm -hmm. Well, FEMA. And the infrastructure bill? Yeah, because they're coming out with Tiger grants again, but we're, we're just a little too darn small for those. That's our problem. I saw something. This is the this new bill that's that like the tiger program there may be an end for us in that um i've always taken I've, every time i've ever looked at tiger it was always way way and, and we got to look at uh, like remember i mean before we clipped al kitty and Faye last time we were looking at uh, more water infrastructure projects and there was that mm -hmm. remember that there was that grant fund i mean i brought it up uh, jokingly 
couple of three weeks ago on the dais, but the, it had something to do with some tribal Indian. Tri yes, I remember. Remember, remember that? that? Yeah. And, but but there was there was reclaimed water money in it. Yes, and you were able to get in there. Yeah. Yeah, you were able to get it, and I and I'm not quite sure. I don't remember the reason why we didn't qualify for that round. But you know, then there were more rounds, and at that time we got rid Brian, of Brian, you save everything. Do you still have the handouts that we did the last time we went? I probably wasn't involved with them. Oh, we asked that. That's right. That might have been before. Ah, I'm sure they're buried here somewhere. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> no, I, I think that's one of the things. One of the things that came across the infrastructure, I thought there might be some openings there, because I think they've opened, they've made it broader. <laughs> Because you're right, with Tiger, we didn't. Well, Tiger years ago. We didn't stand when, a chance at all. When, yeah, when <laughs> we uh, uh, it was uh, Madam Mayor or uh, Mary Lou, you know, she was all about the Tigers, but they were, we didn't qualify. We weren't no, big enough. We did not. But I think there's some other parts of that program that might give us an opening. I'd have to go back and find that email again. Yeah, I was just reading so somewhere. There might be some opportunities there. I mean, obviously, we've got 419, 426. That's always out there because that's a regional roadway. That's not just something that's localized. And uh, so, I mean, I think also I mean, looking at our downtown but, redevelopment, you know, that's something. But, you know, to, to your point, to your question, to me, from the few times I have done it, to, it, it's the atmosphere to do business right in the halls of Congress, in their office, mm -hmm. the time you took to get there and, and go in, I think it's more effective. Would you say so? It would, and also, as they are, Congress is passing the appropriations bills uh, in the House and Senate, it's, it's very good to, to give that local uh, input on what's in those bills. Uh, I agree. Well, well, as far as what our lobbyists are doing, it, we're, we're talking about, like, well, we'll look into if we can figure out a loophole to get into the Tiger bills, and uh, this is kind of all Greek to me. I'm, I'm new at the federal stuff. But isn't that what our lobbyists should be telling us? Like, we shouldn't be having to do research to figure out how we're going to make a list to go up there. Uh, if, if they're on retainer, should they not have sort of found us some grants that we could apply for or found some things that are appropriate to our city? That's where that email uh, came from. Yes. The email was from them. I, I think I think what it is, we give them the ideas, and then they can help slot them okay. into the different programs for us. We so if we don't come up with ideas, if we're not actively coming up with ideas, it's not the collaboration that we intended, no, perhaps. Not true. Let's, no? Let's, okay. Let's, look, look, let's be very clear here, because we're going to have to be very clear on this and other issues, especially to your points. They, can't, they sent us the letter. Let's be clear. We didn't say we need a trip. You got no, I'm not that. saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the... They come up with a lot of stuff. Like when you talk to Jim Davenport, so you've never spoke to these guys. Well, I, I'm trying to. They claim they're, they're calling me, but they never call. They're constantly <laughs> looking for grants and all these different opportunities. And even when we didn't have them all those years, they would still call, hey, you know, we got this. These are a good bunch of guys. And no, we don't always have to come up. To me, this is always like a team. This is like a partnership to work with them. Obviously, the yeah, female. And, 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 and to your point, they don't <laughs> speak to one member. They speak to the group. So they speak through them. <clears throat> right. That's mm -hmm. the way it's set up. So Well, we, all of you have individually had, or except well, maybe Bob. You all have all met him, well, or some of these guys. Them. No, no, the, yeah, well, I'm not sure if Keith has. Well, I, you know what? I, I just want to, like, know who these people are. Well, guess what? Here's the deal. We have a, <laughs> we've invited on a trip. We're not all going to go. You're welcome to go. Go. You should go. I think you should. I'll, st I'll, I'll stay back and be the mayor that week. But you should, you should <laughs> go. I think you, you want to know something? I think you should go. I think you should go. Well, you'll be working, you know, uh, making them holes in no, ones. I, I making them holes in ones. By the way, Councilman Britton got a hole in one this past week. You got a hole in one? Which hole? And was it Twin Rivers? Mm -hmm. Which which one? Nice. Number three? Nice. No, but why don't you go? Because when you go up there, you'll have a totally good appreciation for this. Trust me, you'll love it. And then you get to meet them all. You get to talk to one of the most experienced guys in politics, Skip the Well, I, uh, I, I am interested in meeting Skip. <laughs> hang out with Reagan and Ford and he knows his stuff and he's amazing and Jim's good and you'll have a whole different appreciation. I can tell you all the times we met Congressman Micah here, he was always great. We take bus rides, show him 426. But when we went to Washington and saw him, to me it was more effective. You know, he's in his element, you're there, it's a little bit better. Um, you should go. Do it. 
Well, Patrick, whatever you decide. You want to go? I'll go. We'll just. It's got to be 23rd and 24th. No, I can't go. All right, budget. <clears throat> Mr. Cobb, I'll turn that one over to you. I know it just looks like a brief update. We know that Mr. Booth is under the weather, very kind of him to come in. So we'll be yeah. gentle, kind, and brief. <laughs> How's that sound? Honorable Mayor, council members are always gentle, kind, and I'll try to be brief. <laughs> How you feeling, Jerry? Well, the four of us are gentle and kind. Yeah, the I probably won't be here tomorrow. Um, Kelly, if you can, go to the, the base model. I think you've all had an opportunity to read through the agenda memo. And what the, the agenda memo basically sets up is it covers the struggles that we had last year to, to bring the budget together and, and balance it. Um, and the other thing that it talked about, too, is the forward outlook the financial sustainability of the city. And one of the things that I'm genuinely concerned about, you've heard about the attacks on home rule, I'm genuinely concerned about the state's ability to limit our revenues, either through uh, another homestead exemption or a cut to the communication services tax or a cut to some other intergovernmental stream that comes our way. <clears throat> But so what, you, so what you have in front of you tonight, the first screen is an update to the March presentation that we gave you. And following, we have a solution that we've worked out that makes us sustainable through 2022. It's a solution. It's not necessarily the solution. And there's multiple ways to get there. But we, would, we thought we would just show you how this model worked tonight. Okay. Now, that's a little different than what's in the package, which up there. My, mine, mine's 2017, 2018. That one says 2018, 2019. That's correct. I, we attached last year's okay. to it because basically the agenda memo spoke to last year's. Okay, and that, we used, that was I the base. Yeah. This is what we covered in March. Uh, but in March, what we, what, we went back and we took a look at the March, and uh, we decided that in the revenues, we had originally used a forecasted increase of 5%. So we updated that to 7% for the ad valorem. <laughs> We updated that to 7% for 2019, and we rolled that all the way through to uh, 2022. Have we gotten any guidance yet? I'm sorry. No, we haven't, Mr. Mayor. We have not. Not sure that the 7% is realistic going forward, but I feel right now that the 7% is uh, realistic for the base. Looking at utility taxes, last month we plugged in $100,000. What we did is we went into the financial model and we plugged a 3% increase in year over year through 2022. Uh, licenses, permits, and fees, uh, basically the big number in there is the franchise fees, and we've trended that forward at 1%. On intergovernmental revenue, uh, there's two, two big dollar amounts in there, two revenue streams from the state. We trended those forward at 1% as well. In charges for services, what that number is, is the uh, SRO officers, the school resource officers, we increase those 7% for next year. Uh, other revenues, uh, that basically is interest income. We know that interest income is on the rise due to the rise of the Fed rates. Uh, and so we don't know where that number is going to end up, but it is definitely trending higher. Kelly, if you can, go down through the expenses. We didn't make any changes to the expenses. We're waiting for the uh, May input from the directors, so we kept the numbers exactly the same. There were no changes to transfer in, transfers out, or transfers out debt. Those numbers are the same. However, what we did is we changed a couple of the impact from selected options. If you can go up just a little bit on the right here, Kelly. We included in this model a full implementation, a full implementation of the street lighting district. Okay, which pulls an additional $212,000 out of the general fund. The other thing that we did is we programmed in an increase uh, in the employee contribution towards dependent care for this next year. So those two combined basically took last year's one million, one, last month's one million one fifty-six thousand down to eight hundred ninety-nine thousand. 
So if we go to the bottom, you can still see that even with those changes, we don't meet GFOA's best practices, and uh, also uh, we don't meet our own reserve policy of 14.81%. So we spent the last month, if we, we go up to the top again, to the right, we spent the last month in programming in the changes that we know are coming down the pike. And I believe, Mr. Britton, you spoke to or alluded to a few moments ago about the third homestead exemption. We know well, if that comes up, if that's, pa if that's going to be passed, we were given a potential impact on the city of Oviedo of 1.2 million, and that was last year. I think we all know that we've had substantial growth since that estimate was given to us, so the number is likely to be higher. Um, here this speaks to the 7% in lieu of the 5%. And then we have these other items that we can turn on here, the transfer of the geo bond millage rate to the ad valorem rate. Uh, one of the options was to increase the millage rate for the street lights. Another option is to increase the millage rate 0.25 and then 0.5 half a mil. Okay. Down here, we programmed in the implementation of a fire district. Fire district. You've heard me talk at, um, last year and again in the agenda memo where I brought out I'm real, very concerned about the state's threat um, of being able to attack our revenue sources. So this helps us diversify a little bit, if you will, and gets us out of that state mainstream and gives us another potential um, revenue source. And of course, the use of fund balance. Going down to change in expenses, uh, federal lobbyist, uh, the fire equipment lease, fire bargaining agreement, fire overtime, uh, the 2017 Tax Reform Act that impacted us last month. It looks like that portions of that are going to be rescinded. I'm not, we're not looking at the total impact that we looked at last month. I'm waiting for the final numbers. And, of course, the implementation of the, of the street lighting district. Do not implement the street lighting district. Puts that money back in the general fund. And I also programmed in uh, a line down here for capital facilities maintenance. Because we've not done enough capital facilities maintenance over the last several years. They've kind of gotten what's left over, what falls off the table at the end of the budget process. Jerry, can I ask you just a quick question? Yes, sir. So implement the streetlight district. It's 212,769. Correct. But if we do not implement it, it's 590. Uh, how how what, is that working? Great question. What would happen if we don't implement the street lighting district? We would turn that on and turn this X off. And essentially what it does is it puts $700,000 back into the general fund expenses. Okay, and just one other thing. When you talked about dependent care, did you say we were increasing that or funding it more? Increasing it. Increasing it. It's like the employee it's contribution will be increased. All the employee contributions. Yes, sir, that's correct. Because we were doing, what, 33% or something like that? Last year we were doing about 63%, and we brought it down to, what, 54%. And we know there's going to be some sort of an increase in health care again this year. So we're looking at right now we're just modeling 50%. We're not really sure what the final number is going to be. It's a more of an employee contribution for their dependents. Correct. So it would be a decrease from 54 to 50. Gotcha. Is what it would be. That lowers the so city. Co increased rate. So yeah. it's, it's a double whammy on the yeah. employee. Right. It lowers the city's contribution. Gotcha. Okay. So, Kelly, if you can, um, I don't think I missed anything on that. If we can go you, to the, the four-year outlook. I'm sorry. You, you were finishing up on the capital and facilities maintenance. You were talking about that before. Okay. You had a question. You, you had a question? No, I was just, I, I, I thought you had more to say about that. Just very concerned. Uh, last year when we got done with the budget process, we had over $2 million in capital and facilities requests, and we only funded 330000 or about 12.6%. We can't continue to go on like that uh, because our facilities will deteriorate and we leave things undone that need to be done. So that's my main concern. It's happened year over year since I've got here. It's the same as the, the paving program. You, you fall behind, it's very hard to catch up. What, um, for that 500000 What do you have a list of the, the, the projects you, you would like to, to use that for? We've got last year's list. We don't have an updated list yet this year. Uh, we should have that by the end of, uh, probably sometime in June, actually, because we meet together in June and we go over the capital and the facilities requests that need to be considered. Mm -hmm. uh, year over year, it gets larger. Now, on the on the revenue side, the change in revenues, the 
um, there's no dollar amounts associated with the um, the the different revenue sources. What? Um, Where are we at? At the top, the, the top right. to the top right. Okay. Right what here. What is the dollar amounts associated with those? Two? We're going to turn those on in just a minute. Oh, okay. Sorry, didn't want to. Right. Thunder. They're just queuing it up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Basically, what we've done is we've included these in here into the model so that when we turn them on, you can see the effect of turning them on. We can develop others if we want to do some what-if analysis tonight. Uh, I don't know that we can program them that quickly because the model is fairly sophisticated, but um, we can program some different things in. So basically, that's the first sheet. The first sheet drives everything that takes place in back of it. So if we go to the four-year outlook um, and go down, you'll see that the, the thing I want to point out with the four-year outlook is down here, our actual reserve balance is declining year over year over year. So we're just not financially sustainable in our current model. So if we go up and we do a, a couple different things, if we, um, let me see, we turn on the implement the fire district here, and that would take place in the year 2020. And if we implement the fire district, basically what that does is that offsets the expected ad valorem revenue loss. Okay, so the implementation of the fire district would be for the amount of revenue loss that we have for that third homestead exemption. All right, it's a wash. It's another revenue source. It's a wash. Okay. The other thing that we consider doing is some sort of a millage rate increase. What is that millage rate increase? Um, we found that in this model, a half a mil works. So Kelly, if you can turn that on. If we go down to the bottom on the left here, you'll see that um, the actual re we meet the GFOA's uh, best target, and we also meet the actual reserve city policy of 15%. If we go to the, the uh, four-year outlook, you'll see that uh, we meet the GFOA's best practices year over year, uh, and we also meet the city's policy, although it's declining slightly. We still haven't done anything yet for facilities maintenance. The only way that, um, or initially in this model, shouldn't, I shouldn't say the only way, but what we did for the sake of this model to uh, re obtain a revenue source for uh, facilities maintenance is we increased if we can go back, Kelly, Kelly, to the base. Oh, we do it right here. Um, we increased the implementation of the fire district from 1.7 million to from 1.2 million. I'm sorry, to 1.7 million. The argument that I have for that is that your facilities, your capital facilities maintenance, really are a component of your general fund. Okay, and if we increase the uh, implementation of the fire district from 1.2 million to 1.7 million. Then what we're doing is we're freeing up non-ad valorem and ad valorem revenues to cover the facilities and maintenance expense. So that just gives us another $500,000 out of the general fund. We would transfer over to the, the fire district fund, and we would use those monies um, towards the capital and facilities maintenance. So, so are you saying that it's, it's uh, an either-or thing? We can fund the fire buildings through the fire district fund or we could fund them through the general fund no <clears throat> what i'm saying is that what i'm saying is that if we want to to create a funding source for capital facilities maintenance we can increase the fire district from 1.2 to 1.7 million that increases the sources going into the special revenue fund created for the fire district okay and that's less money that the general fund would have to spend for fire public safety services. But isn't so, it an all or nothing? Like either we have a fire district and it's self-contained or we don't. Can, we no. can't just like have half of it. No, we can piecemeal it. I, I, I don't, no, we can piecemeal it. We don't have to do all of it. Either. Actually, it's a fire assessment fee. Okay. You know, it's not a district. It's really a fire assessment fee. That's what we're looking to create. And, and what would be part of that component? I'm sorry? Uh, so would that, that would not be set up in a similar way as the special lighting district or it would would be set up in a similar way yes okay so this would be an, an effort to get rid of 
counting this towards millage, so it would be different from how Winter Springs is doing their, their fire district. Could be. I'm not familiar with how they're doing okay. their fire district. Actually, that's, is that the Winter Springs or the county? Uh, Winter Springs. Well, Winter, Winter Springs is the Yeah, yeah. But they, they do theirs as a, as a millage just tacked on there. Okay. No, 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 no. no. Where theirs is a millage? No, no, no. Are you sure? Positive. It's, a, it's the Seminole County fire fee. Well, yeah. yeah. But it, it, and it's it's isn't done as millage. No, it's not millage. It's a fee. It's technically a fee. Everybody writes it off their taxes, but it's yeah. technically a fee. Okay. I don't. I, when you look at a, a tax bill, I, I can't tell the difference between Jerry, a fee and a tax. Just a quick question. Yes, sir. Sorry, we'll get you done. Um, that that fire thing is that something you all discussed in staff, like the as an as an option? I don't ever remember us even broaching that subject. We discussed it um, last year when we had our one-on-one -on -one meetings with you. We kind of touched on the various different options. Um, we. We're basically looking at, we're doing some forward looking, forward, you know, thinking and just trying to come up with ways to mitigate the impact that the state has on our revenue sources. And again, this isn't the solution, it is a solution. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, we have to consider, if we want to keep on doing business as normal, we have to consider either some sort of a significant millage rate increase, cut back in services of some sort, Okay, or finding additional revenue sources. I am genuinely concerned about the state's ability to, to impact our revenue streams. And that's really why I am talking about the implementation of a fire assessment fee. And that's really why we've been talking about the implementation of a fire, excuse me, and a street lighting district, is to find these other revenue sources that the state can't take away from us. Because it's about financial sustain sustainability. And right now, the, through 2022, if we turn off the fire district, if we turn off the half millage rate increase, if we turn off the street lighting district, we are not sustainable. You we pulled every rabbit out of the hat last year to balance the budget. We don't have any rabbits left. Do you, know, you know, obviously they, they, they encroach on everything, you know, um, the state trying to, trying to stop you from doing this, the extra homestead, all this stuff. I mean, do you ever see them get, it could have been a good question for Chris, but I mean, if they get to the point where they say you're not allowed to do fees either, you can only do millage. That that wouldn't put it past them. Anything's possible. You know, but if this, I'm hoping. I, the reason I ask is I, I already hear it already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that it's, if this is done now, you would have to be grandfathered in. Right. Okay. Um, and there's nothing to say that. What's the state's next slice of the uh, uh, millage rate? Is, or the, what's the next homestead exemption? Now it's, what, 25 on the first 50, 25 on the next 50, 25 over 100,000. Is it going to be another 25 over 150? Where are they going to stop at? Okay. And we're a growing city. We, we continue to, to need more police officers um, and, and other services. And we, we can't stop growing and not fund them. Because like I said, the, Dominic pointed this out. That's different than what we have, but is the negotiations with the firemen in there too? Or have you considered, you got that? Book? Yes, that's in there. All right, so just a quick question. I don't know if you have the answer to this, but fire fee, street light fee, the, 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 the union contract, all of that, how much is the average house paying for all of that if we implemented all of it? I don't have that available tonight. Get that? I'd like sure. to just know what that is. Absolutely. How much it is to, to do it? Because that, that, that's really the, the, the big question I think everybody would want to know. Yeah, we don't have any guesstimates for the impact on the streetlight district yet, and we haven't done any modeling yet on the fire uh, at all. But we can definitely model the millage rate and come up with something for street lighting. And I can talk to Will Dan about giving me something for just best guesstimate. Obviously, nothing's sure. real until we do it. But just to figure Absolutely. out, absolutely, because eventually, like you, said, you just said, we have a lot of things to pay for. <coughs> we have a full service, awesome city that, that has to get paid for. And I think if you lay it out, see, most the average Joe is going to look at this and go, okay, what does that mean for me? And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get. How if we did all of that? We're we're good. The city's good. And how much does it cost the average home in Oviedo? Understood. That's what I. That's what I. Like Understood. To so Thank the you. Fire fee in Seminole County is two point seven six four nine. And that's not as millage. That is. They, they do it as a millage, but it's really a fee. Well, yeah, yeah, but if you call it, if you actually calculate what it will be based on millage. That counts against your 10 mil cap under the Florida Constitution. If you count it as a fee, which is what the whole discussion was with the lighting district, 
you the, reconfigure it right, somewhere. The, I think there fires a fee. We'll double. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious sure. how that's. Pretty, yeah, it's got to be a fee because you wouldn't want. Yeah, to well, you can right call. It, well, no, but you can call it a fee and still calculate it based on millage. So if we were, to, so if we were to implement our lighting district as millage, just to make it a break-even thing from last year. If we use the millage method, that would still count against. Are y'all following this? It would still count against the ticks, ten mills under the constitution. But if we did one of the other methods, where you say, well, you have ten acres or whatever it was, two and a half, you know, twenty-four hundred square feet. If we did it by one of those methods, then it would be a true <coughs> fee, and it's a whole different falls under different statute for the moment. So you can have all the fees you want. Well, that's an important point because my another one of my concerns is that they're pushing us towards that 10 mil cap, and once they get us there, there's well, nothing the, else we can do. Well, then, then you convert it all to fees. Uh, so, but my, you can only my have so many. You can only legally have so many fees. I mean, well, no, huh. there's no limit to how many fees, but there is a limit to millage. So my inclination is, but you have is, to, you have to be able to justify it through a, through an enterprise well, fund, basically. Yeah. Well, with, with a fee, you have to be able to show. You have to show what the result is. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and it's one, one of the things Mr. Groot often says, you know, when does a fee become a tax? Right. Okay, and so that's that's your fine line that you walk any time you institute a fee is what is, the, what is the result of that fee? What are you using that fee for? Obviously, with these, in these two cases, it's, you know, for street lighting and as well as for fire services. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, we, we're exploring all kinds of other different options as well. But the thing that we wanted to at least to be able to show you is that our decisions that we make, like Jerry said, we went to extraordinary lengths last year. And so we developed this multiple year model because we wanted to see what the impact of our decisions going forward. And and so that helps us, you know, into figuring out, you know, like you can see there, there's a yes, there's a couple of no's, there's a yes. Um, and so we want to try to be able, as Jerry said, we want to try to get it so that we have yeses across the board so that we know that we're not only covering our operations, we're not only covering our capital, but we also have our reserves set up in a sustainable manner, you know, so that in case we do have another Irma, or we do, you know, hopefully we don't, but we're ready for it. And so that was one of the things that we wanted to show you tonight is that a lot of the stuff that we bring up, there's a method to the madness. And a lot of times we're looking beyond this fiscal year, looking out, because we, we can see, as I said, there, there's a train at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And Jerry's right. We are concerned about what's happening at the state. We do feel like they're pushing us toward the 10 mills. I, for one, feel like they're trying to push us to consolidate. If you figure they only have 67 counties to deal with, if they could reduce the 400 and some cities, you know, then they would probably be pretty happy about that. And, of course, Chris, you know, backs that up with their legitimate distrust with local government. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do. We're trying to, trying to look for ways that maybe they haven't thought of yet. You know, and if we can get that taken care of, uh, we're looking at some of the stuff. Orange County is pretty creative. We're looking at some of the stuff that Orange County is doing, too, to see if there's a way we could take advantage of that. But the stuff they've done actually counts toward that 10 mils, mm -hmm. you know. And so we got to figure that out. Getting back to that, that fee, I, that the Sentinel calls it a tax. The chairman yeah. called it a fee. <laughs> well, it, I, I think it I is, it's implemented as a millage. So for us, if we were to implement the lighting district as a millage for now, which is, a, I said it the day we were talking about, and I still support it, stick with that until we hit our cap, and then, then go to the thing where you convert it to a fee. I don't know if that helps no. you get yeah, that, yeah, that, that helps, that doesn't that hurt you because. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, that's doing what the state wants you to do. And then by that time, then the state may take, action, take yeah. action against fees. Yeah, it, it, there's no reason to not so. treat it like a tax because that's exactly what it is uh, until the last, last possible minute because maybe this won't pass. So if the homestead doesn't pass, we still have a problem. Oh, 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 oh that's passing. <laughs> well, you know, well, we had the same thing. I, I, I've been researching uh, you know, old, old ballot stuff, and back in 2003 or 2004, that's the last time, that's when we got the, the 25000 again, and everybody had the same reaction. Then, oh, this is going to kill the budgets. This is going to be so bad. And everybody's okay. 
Did because the, the values are so no, high. It, 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 no, it, it was bad. It was no, bad. You weren't sitting here. It did. <laughs> kill the it did. I, I remember it was very bad. Well, they, they cut but but then you just readjust, and it's okay now. Yeah, it was sort of a double whammy what happened then, because you did have the redemption of revenue, but then the state also swooped in behind it. Right. Cut and, legis bill. and legislatively said, okay, you've got to go down to this artificial number of millage, which made the impact of the homestead even worse. Right, so all of this deferred maintenance they're talking about is all from back then? So okay, these so homes, these homestead exemptions, it, it's great for the state. Brian, you just hit it. They eventually would like to just be the only government in Florida. And they, 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 they take this 25,000, well, it was 50, it'll be 75 when, if this, it, when this passes. People will go, oh, this is great. Yeah, I'm cutting my taxes. But somebody's got to pay for something, so they'll just blame it on us. That's why people come up, but your point's well taken, though. It's got to be a fee, because if you're adding to your millage, you're getting to that close to 10 like they want us to. And then all of a sudden they'll say that you can't do fees anymore, and you got to get these things grounded. The, the <coughs> thing that I look at... If we're going to do it. I mean, no, no one's decided we're doing anything. If you ask any citizen, hey, you're getting an extra 25000 off your off of your, uh, your assessed value, and then it goes, you know, they do the math. <laughs> hey. But the thing about it is, is that if local businesses and people who own non homesteaded <clears throat> property wake up to this, then there's a good chance, yes, that there could be a very strong opposition coming out. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, right now, um, if we were sitting here and this was homesteaded property and this is non homesteaded in businesses, okay? And let's say it passes, and so the revenue drops, okay? And then everybody does this together, but it's exactly. these people are still away. Well, the thing about it is these people are still paying 100%, you know, and these people are getting a reduction. Well, those people in their right hand go up 10% mm -hmm. year, year too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so let's say the city, we go through and we do the analysis and we find the few people things that... left hand can only go up 3% a year and just give them 25000 more off. Well, that's the thing, and the thing is, is that we find some scraps that we can cut from services, but in the end, we have to come before you and recommend a millage increase. What happens is, is that it goes like this. These people are still paying full freight more, yes, yeah. and these two are still getting the discount. So if these people wake up and say, wait a minute, I'm not paying, I'm paying, I'm footing this bill, I have a feeling that, you know, there may be a concerted effort, but it's going to take those local businesses and wow. it's going to take those, you know, non-homesteaded property owners. Well, all the people who rent that. anywhere or who own rental properties, you would think would rise up and say, well, this is going to impact my rent. It, they don't, it, they don't it, see it, it that way. They don't, they don't. Well, if somebody told them, they would see yeah. it that way. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you're a single homestead it's in my best interest to vote here for in it. Florida. <laughs> No, the tax system we have is the best system in the world. It is. But it's actually the, the it's, one it's of the most inequitable. inequitable systems in the world yeah. also. And, you know, the average citizen who, you know, just has their homestead, <laughs> they think it's great. I mean, I paid $3,400 a year on my house 22 years I've lived <laughs> there. When I moved here, it was, you know, a couple of thousand. And that's ridiculous. When we moved from New York, Debbie and I, our house was $5,200 a year in taxes. It's half the size of this, and that was 22 years ago. I have the tax bill still. You can only imagine what the tax is on the house now. And I'm not suggesting we go to New York style taxes, but right. it just, it's just inequitable. <laughs> I looked up somebody in the Chicago area. It was 11.5 for a house smaller than mine. I believe it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> but there's also a lot of service on the end of that as well. You know, no, not really up there. I mean, I, I don't know yeah. how we provide as much as There's we do for, for as little nah, as we up do. There, yeah, yeah, no too. services. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the uh, so, nah, sales tax, everything. Can we go back to the sheet with all the the things? Oh, or? Bob is intrigued. Look at him. Yeah, like you know, you know what? Yeah. He almost fell asleep on us <laughs> earlier, and now he's just like woken up. No, the the a spreadsheet. So go back to the base tab. With the base tab. Okay. Okay. So so you have right now you have the the half mil increase turned on the and then you have the fire district at 1.7 million correct yes and you're and you're still you still have a deficit to best practices in in years two and three yes 
uh, here in 2020 and 21. I would have to look at that. Yes, we do have a, uh, a deficit there. Reserve balance is okay. But yes, our reserve balance is okay, and we haven't looked that deeply into the into the model, Mr. Pollock. But mm -hmm. we may be able to balance this a different way. Okay. And I, and I think that. No, it's based on the 16.67. Yes, it's 16.67. That's, that's practice. Yeah. It's not based on the 15. Gotcha. Oh, okay. So we're not breaking Yeah, we should have yeses down, down here just to. <laughs> yeah. Now, we are going to have to slow down the growth, too. I mean, that's going to happen. At some point. Yes. That's, mm -hmm. at, some, at some point, I mean, we're, I know we're seeing it now. I mean, it, mm -hmm. their prices are leveling, and interest rates are coming up. And in some cases, they're kind of. <laughs> Sellers are here, buyers, buyers are, are here, yeah. <laughs> and appraisals are here. So. Yeah, which is why I don't think the 7% is sustainable in our model going forward. It is this year, perhaps next year, but I don't think it is. They're going to get more than 7% this year. Yeah. Gonna, how about lunch? It's, it's only five after this year. That's oh, only five? Seven this year, and then we have okay. five. That's a, an increase in values, that, that, or does that include uh, new construction coming online? Uh, that would include everything. Uh, that's currently in the model, which would be new construction. We just roll it forward. We don't know what the, you know, how much new construction will be out there in the future, but we have that built into the model, so we just roll current new construction forward. Well, a lot of a lot of our new construction, our high dollar new constructions in the CRA, which means we only get fifty percent of that. Well, we don't have to do it that way. We could end our CRA <laughs> and and use that no. for the general fund. I, I, I don't know if that has been explored much from your end. I thought about it, but I have a few years till retirement yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, maybe you could think about that. Because <laughs> if the CRA is where all the value is, and we're using it for, uh, last year we didn't have enough to use for anything but really debt payment, I think is what would, our main thing was. But any thoughts or any suggestions that y'all might have in this model, just let us know. We'll be glad to simulate anything. We could really use any input from the outside that you might see that we don't. Um, and we'll be glad to send um, these paper copies to you. Is there a way you can put the actual Excel sheet out for us? Yeah, I was, I was wondering the same thing. Did you, you want to put the Excel sheet out? Yeah, we can do that. That'd be cool. Uh, I would do something to it so we don't corrupt your master file, you know, playing with it, but figure that out. What did you want, to, want us to do? Just to, to play with it on it our own. For us to look at and if we, you know, maybe come up with some. some Send your copies of the model. I don't, want to, I don't want to do it in such a way that that your hard work gets corrupted somehow because we've. we've well, no, there, there's this yeah, on don't, their, don't there's on their server. Yeah. 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 But we, we, can, we can send you copies of the model yeah. if you'd like to do that. Yeah, we send can do that. Absolutely. Have you developed a, a nuclear option like you did last year with a with a line in the sand? If we do this, this is what we can do. No. Okay. Kelly, you, you said I'm sorry. You said you put seven percent there for this year. Mm -hmm. Five every year after. Mm -hmm. Can you plug in eleven percent? Eleven percent for this year. Yeah. Plug it in. I had a question for you. Does that fix everything? Rough. I'm sorry. I think you need to turn, just turn the stuff off. off for yeah, just turn everything off. Let's see what happens. I'm just curious. Yay! It works. Well, we're, we're sort of. That a miracle. <laughs> sort of. We still don't meet the target balance. We're close. We're, yeah. We're over the 15%, America. though. That's the, what we've got to do, right? The 15. We have to. But, uh, you know, it happens on the four year. No, you want the best practices there, though, because well, yeah. if they if they want to do oh, anything with bond rating, yeah, you want to send it back. You want to make sure that, that mess with bond ratings. And then, guys, I rudely interrupted Councilman Britton. I thought he was done. No, oh, I was just Definitely asking about the the chart you made last year with the line in the sand of here's here's what we can do with this budget, and as we we're do different that, options, that line can go down or up. We're putting that together now. Okay. And uh, a couple of you ask us to expand our net this year and just really look at, try to look at everything. Okay. So the list will probably be more expanded this year, and then 
the overall list will be more expanded. And then what we can do will depend on, you know, how far, like you said, the line in the sand. Yeah. What we you know, do. this is this is really tough stuff, but there's no better time than now to do it than wait till we uh, hit rock bottom two years or three years from now, and then we really have a, a problem. You know, well, that's, you know, no one's going to be happy with with the solutions, but. Be well, I, I, I really honestly, to your point, I honestly think this number here is too low. Yeah. What, what's your dream number? Or what's, I, I guess it's probably Drew who has a dream number in mind. I would rather, <laughs> I would rather look at the list and prioritize the projects, but I'm thinking uh, at least 750000 Okay. At least. And one of the things, the reason we focused on 2022 is that's when certain debts start yeah yeah we got to get to that point and get the yeah the, the free up the the uh, it's loan that, capacity you know once we get to that survivability of 2022 i'm not going to say that our situation is going to get easier but we're going to have monies that we don't have now yeah, it's going to get better. you know and but it's just being able to ride that ride that 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 stream to get to that point and we create a pathway so that we can and that's why we developed the wrong way, long range model to see, okay, what's it going to take to get us there? You know, and so we talked about that with the seniors. The seniors think they're all going to be dead before we get a senior center. I said, no, we get a couple yeah. years. Yeah. Couple years. <laughs> People are supposed to live to 100 years now. Yeah. No, they'll live. Yeah. And to Mr. Cobb's point, you can see the transfer out debt, how it declines year over year to 2022. Yeah, that's a pretty big number. All right, do we have any more questions for Jerry? Because he did come in while he was. Well, I wouldn't touch this microphone after I leave. <laughs> Thanks for coming in, Jerry. Before we leave, Steve's gone. Thank you so much. Don't worry about it. Feel better, Jerry. <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean to chase him away. Does anybody have any more questions? I mean, good. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I will. Uh, your will is good. I, just, I, I, uh, I always will, maybe. but I have to ponder. Okay, good. So, uh, let's see if y'all have any suggestions. Please go. Yeah, that's the neat thing about this. We can do what ifs. Mm -hmm. What if we did? Yeah. When will we know about the, 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 the mayor was talking about plugging 11 percent, you know, last year. What do we have, six or seven? When are we going to know the actual number? We usually get that guidance in June. Right? June? End of May, beginning of June. They probably got it out already, the preliminaries out. I thought we would. <clears throat> no, it's not out. I thought we would get a preliminary in May, and they solidify the number a lot better in June. Sometime in May. Yeah, we get we get a letter, you know, that gives us guidance. Oh, well, you get up, you get you get up that much, you get you know, you get that much uh, percentage. You'd be uh, happy. This year. This year, and we get we skate another. We skate another. All right, well, we live one year. No, we got to keep looking. Did at you catch what he had? No. Good. <clears throat> All yeah, right, what we've decided is we just, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, okay. what we've decided we just can't do the budgeting the way that we've done it in the past, and we have to figure out, like Mr. Cobb said, the impact of the current year decisions on future years. Right. Mr. Cobb, do you have anything else for us? That is all I have, Mayor. You sure? Yes, sir. All righty. Well, then it's uh, almost 8 o'clock. We're out of here. <laughs>